All right. Good morning, everybody. Good Welcome morning. back. And this is getting down to the end, isn't it? It's the second to last day already. And uh, it's really been a tremendous blessing. Every day, uh, my cup has ran over. And I hope it's been the same for all of you. And last night was really just another beautiful presentation. And, and then as I was leaving, there was a group, and I think a number of you have already experienced this, but a group walked down the driveway here just a couple hundred yards. And where the hillside here meets the creek, there's a bit of an open area and there's an extraordinary natural phenomenon that our father has blessed us with. There's a little firefly that has a glow that is so disproportionate to its size. It's just a little bit bigger than a rice grain, but yet it glows, its light shines in such a magnification. And it's just an object lesson for us, but these fireflies are unique. They're actually called blue ghosts. They have a bluish hue and they don't just blink like most fireflies. They stay aglow and sometimes for up to 20 seconds. And they just trace little lines and it's just silent, complete silent. You just see these lights. It's like embers on a fire at night. It's just the most beautiful thing. So it was such a blessing to be able to experience that. So this time uh, we're gonna hear from our dear elder brother Abraham, who has left his family, his beloved wife and his children and his farm to come over here and to fellowship with us and to share what God's placed on his heart. And so at this time, Abraham, please share with us. Okay, um, may I ask two men to come up and pray for me, Kurt and Ben. I, I believe in the laying on of hands. And so I'll kneel and I ask that one of you pray for me. Okay. 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 And lay your hands on me. <clears throat> Kirk, I'm going to ask you to do it too. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day. And we're so grateful for all the blessings you've showered upon us. And Father, in a special way right now, we ask for uh, a special infilling of your spirit for each one here. Mm. But now, especially for our dear brother Abraham, we pray that the words that he speaks would be the words that come from the altar that you would touch his lips with a coal from the altar and mm. and just uh father if there's if you have any changes you have in mind for what he planned to say we just pray that you would take over mm. we just want to hear from you through your vessel through your channel and we just praise you for abraham we praise you especially for jesus mm. in his precious name we pray amen amen, amen. <clears throat> okay yes i i uh i have enjoyed every speech very much um are these lights necessary okay <laughs> kind of blinding <laughs> it's um, worse at night much worse <laughs> um i have enjoyed every speech very much i'm very blessed and so um the reason i came is to be blessed and to be a blessing mm, amen. so anyway the the subject i am planning to speak about is pantheism and it may not be very important to us here, but I'd like to give you a little bit of my history in not understanding it and how God helped me to understand it the way I do now. So I just want to share. I think there's a great danger in pantheism and it's very easy to get there, even non-Trinitarians. And so I'll go back in history a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I have ever since I've known Adventist people, I have heard about uh, Ellen White's warnings to uh, Ch uh, Kellogg, Dr. Kellogg, his book, uh, Living Temple. I never understood what the problem was for many years. And 
So in uh, 2014, um, Corey McCain, you know him, Ben. Corey McCain was there and he was warning people of the danger of pantheism. He thought they talk very pantheistic there, some of them do. And so he was warning and I still didn't get it. I did not understand until I read this statement. Um, <clears throat> the statement says that the Father and Son, the, the Holy Spirit is the same as the literal or personal presence of the Father and Son. Amen. This statement opened my eyes. Now, you may not understand how that opened my eyes, so I would like to, um, I would like to explain from the Bible. And um, where was that statement from again? Where was the statement from? I'd rather not say. Oh. It's just a statement in a newsletter that I read, but supposedly non-Trinitarian people made this statement. Oh, so it wasn't Spirit of Prophecy. Oh, I no, no. Spirit of Prophecy. No. Never mind. So, so this statement helped me to, to uh, understand what pantheism is. And I'll try to explain that. But, uh, anyway. Uh, oh, the dictionary. I, when you look at the dictionary, for the word pantheism, it will tell you that it is the belief that God is everywhere. And, and still I'm like, what's wrong with that idea? And, and so, so, uh, so I'd like to read uh, Psalm 139, part of it, and, <clears throat> and then I'd like to ask, well, I'll, I'll read part of it and then might ask some questions. Psalm 139. And by the way, uh, going back into my history of misunderstanding this, um, a um, good friend of ours, Ramon Irasari, gave me a book by Corey McCain trying to explain this. Corey McCain's book is very detailed, but I, I still didn't get it until I saw this statement. Um, so, Psalm 139, um, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me 
and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth, shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Uh, I'll stop right here, but I'd like to ask if anyone here, there's a key verse in here, that is the answer to this. Uh, can somebody point it out? Verse, this issue of the path the Verse seven. Seven is what I mm -hmm. comes to mind. Spirit and thy presence being synonymous. Yeah. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? So, <clears throat> so um, if we read this, we we're like, doesn't this sound like? pantheism i mean just doesn't this sound like god is everywhere yes he is by his spirit so so now let me try to explain the difference in the idea that he's everywhere literally or personally um so what would happen if uh, if he were here literally, the Father? We would all die. Yeah. We would be consumed. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just thought it might help to just clarify pantheism just a little bit more because I think your statement could 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 be could it, it, it could go one way or the other. It could be a positive thing. It could be a negative thing depending on how we define it. I know that's what you're probably headed headed to, to to look into. I think also to, in addition to that, isn't pantheism teaching that God is everything? So there's separation between God and the creation. I, so that I just yeah, I, I think like, it leads to that. But what I found in in the dictionary it wasn't very clear. It just said the teaching or the religion that God is everywhere. In it didn't say in everything, but if he's everywhere, he's in the trees, he's in the animals. And so I'll just just bring out some scriptures showing the difference in his literal personal presence and also the Son, the Son of God. Um, anyway, uh, Psalm 68 verse 2 says, The wicked perish at the presence of God. And uh, then let me go to John chapter 14. It, I know this is a this is a subject that was very hard for me to understand. It was very hard for me to understand why Ellen White had such a problem with with Kellogg's book. But I I never read Kellogg's book, so I don't know what it all said. Um, but um, John 14, reading from verse 15 to 18, um, If ye love me, this is the words of Christ, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he, uh, he may abide 
with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you, in you by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Not literally, personally, mm -hmm. or maybe I misunderstand the word personally, but not literally. Abraham, I, so when you shared that first statement, I said amen, because that's what I believe. But I don't believe, when I, when, when I think the, the per, whoever made that statement, whatever newsletter it was in, I think what they were trying to do was to counter those that say the Holy Spirit is a separate person or being from the Father and the Son. That when Ellen White says the Holy Spirit is as, as much a person as the Father is a person, most Trinitarians assume she means a separate being. Right. And when we say the Holy Spirit is the personal presence of the Father and Son, we're not saying it's their literal presence. Obviously, their bodily presence is in heaven, yeah. where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. The, their personal presence is through their spirit, clearly. Right. But I think the person saying that, I mean, <clears throat> maybe it sounded heretical to, uh, or pan pantheistic to you, but it's to address Seventh-day Adventists in particular that misunderstand the writings of Ellen White when she says the Holy Spirit is a person. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, going to John 1.18. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to explain the difference in the Father's literal presence and his spiritual yes. presence. Yes. Yeah. And I think we're all on the same page. Right yeah. There, right? uh, John 1 18 says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And John 6 46. Six forty six. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. And then <clears throat> Matthew five eight says, The pure in heart shall see God. Amen. So we see clearly that no man has seen the Father, but we will, Amen. the righteous will. Amen. Um, in 1 John 3, verse 2, there's another one I'd like to read. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And um, there are some verses in Exodus that I would like to point out which uh, which will uh, show the difference between the father and the son um, we know that uh, the father only has immortality uh, he's the only potentate the only wise and I know some of those uh, like only potentate, we might say then nobody else has any power. Christ doesn't have any power. But when we understand that the Father is the source of all power through his Son, 
then we can understand why the Father is the only potentate and the only wise. Mm -hmm. He's the source for everything. Um, in um, Exodus 23, um, verses 20 and 21, Exodus 23, verses 20 and 21. I'm in the wrong book. 23, Exodus 23. 20 and 21. Okay, <clears throat> this I would understand. The Father is speaking to Moses. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. Let's remember that the son's name, the father's name is in the son. Mm -hmm. And uh, Exodus 32, 34. Well, at least the father speaking through the son, but the son was giving the word for the father. Yeah. Exodus thirty-two thirty-four. Therefore, now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. So here again, that's just saying he will send his son with them. And <clears throat> Exodus 33, uh, starting in verse 1, <clears throat> And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. <clears throat> and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, and so on. And verse 3, Unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Now, let's notice this verse. He says, I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. So I have to conclude this was the Father. <clears throat> And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment, and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Hore. <clears throat> and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. 
And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. Yahweh. I'm going to use the, the name Yahweh. And remember <clears throat> that the Father said, My name is in him. Yeah. And no man has seen God at any time. Yeah. So, so let's try to put this together. Um, I'll read on and then I think it'll become clear who he was talking to face to face and who he was not able to. So there's a difference in the father and son as far as coming into his literal presence In the Father's presence, people would be consumed, but not in the Son's presence. <clears throat> and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again unto the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, Show me thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. <clears throat> and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to, to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face. Mm. Just a few verses earlier, it said, Moses spake to Yahweh face to face. But now, this person says, Thou canst not see my face. So I have to conclude that the verses earlier, it was talking about the Son of God. Moses was able to speak face to face with the Son of God, but not with the Father. And we have to remember that 
the name, the Son of God can use the same name, Yahweh. Or the Father's name is in him. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take my hand away, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. <clears throat> so that, uh, to me, that is clarifies that there, there was a difference in the Father and the Son, where the people could not see the father's face and live but the son was able to speak face to face with moses and so the the you won't see my face but you see my back parts that is the, not sure i don't know how to explain that mm -hmm. uh, but he you said understand i will that's the father in this verse is how you're understanding yeah that. Okay that he will see his back parts but his face he couldn't see and live it's but like verse 11 right that's the son so uh anyway we all know that uh, like first corinthians 10 uh, i'd just like to read a few verses making sure that we understand that it was christ who led the children of Israel through the wilderness. First Corinthians 10. <coughs> Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ um, I'd like to read a few verses in uh, Ver, uh, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. And I want to, uh, I want to give some time for question and answers after I'm finished. 15, what? 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Um, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Uh, so after this change, we will be able to see God. The Bible says we shall see God. And after this change, we will be able to see God face to face and live. Um, <clears throat> anyway, 1 Corinthians 3.16 talks about the Spirit of God dwelling in us. We are, um, we are his temple. So, so uh, anyway, I'm <clears throat> I've gone through my scriptures, and I would like to 
to uh, kind of close if I could, but then ask for questions and answers. If I know that there might be a lot of questions or, and it might help me too. Maybe so just at the end of your presentation, you could just clarify like in simple terms, like what you believe is the presence of God, you know, his spirit and, and how that connects yeah. to so, with pantheism. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, so if we, if we believe that the Father is literally everywhere, is that the right word to use? No. Literally? Well, yeah. yeah bodily? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bodily, literally, yeah. I think we so, so, uh, I think it, there's a danger of worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Amen. Because we, we could say, well, God is in the tree over there. So why not go talk to the tree? Why not go talk, pray to the God in that tree? And very soon we think uh, the tree is God itself. And it's like, if we believe that, I mean, I've, I've already heard the expression that we can have the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ in us so fully that we are Christ. Ooh. We're no longer, we are Christ when we allow his spirit so fully in us. And that, to me, that seems scary. That seems like pantheism. Like, if we believe the, that God is literally everywhere, then it leads to animal worship or, or trees or... Self-worship. Self, -worship. self, -worship. Yeah. self or... Holy flesh. Uh, that's the best way I can explain it. That mm. the phrase that the Spirit of God is the same as his literal personal presence, that helped me to see the danger in that idea. So so we have to we need to understand, I believe, that in the Father's presence now we would be consumed. But when our bodies are changed, we will be able to walk among the stones of fire in his presence. And so also there, I think it's important to understand that there's a difference in the Father and the Son, that the Son was able to be our mediator from the inception of sin. So, uh, can I can I pray and then I yeah. might walk around if. <laughs> if uh, so, let's just pray and then uh, more questions and answers. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for your spiritual presence here. I. Uh, Thank you for all the presentations that you have done through your instruments here. And uh, I ask now that you would help me to humble my heart. And uh, if, if I have said anything that is contrary to truth, then help somebody in the group here to, to be able to find it out and show it to me and to everybody else. We, we're here to learn of you. <coughs> so uh, we just ask for a greater art outpouring of your spirit in this campaign. In your precious son's name. <coughs>